Thank you, Jose Marie, for that extravagant introduction. Um, I guess one other thing that I'll add is I'll be presenting my remarks today in assembly language. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I think I know one, one code, uh, one operation in assembly language from when I used to work on computers a long time ago. But I have been a beneficiary of the extraordinary work that uh, all of you do. As, as you know, uh, chemists have benefited from the work of information and library science probably as much as any discipline being uh, able to search uh, organic substructures uh, very early in the uh, move of scholarly information to uh, the internet uh, and the chemical abstract service being uh, online and searchable very early in, in, in all of these uh, advances that we've seen. And uh, <clears throat> the same thing with the U.S. Patent Office and, and its publications. So uh, the work that you all do to, to provide information to scholars is of, uh, is of great interest to me, and it's a privilege to be the chancellor of a university that has such an outstanding school of informational library science. Um, and I thank you for all of the, the work that you all do and welcome you to Chapel Hill. It's um, hard to imagine a topic that is uh, more central to what we're trying to do as a university and what all of you are trying to do at, at your universities and what we're trying to do in higher education. Um, I thought what I would do today is to talk to you about um, kind of where I see universities moving. Um, Today, there's a big thing going around the internet among university administrators. Gordon Gee, who's the president of Ohio State, apparently gave a big talk yesterday and talked about how we need to reinvent uh, universities if we want to survive in this climate. I'm not quite as uh, alarmist as he is. We've been doing this for 500 years, so my guess is we'll probably keep doing this as we uh, go forward. But and it's certainly you know, that our ability to interact with information is uh, what's going to define our, our success. So I'm, I'll, I will talk a little bit about some challenges we face, but I'm not quite going to sound the alarm bell that we need to worry about the future of higher education, because I think, if anything, this climate that we're in is going to increase the importance of universities uh, rather than decrease it. And just to show you kind of how attuned people are in our university to their information and give you a little feel of what it's like to be the chancellor of a university so that maybe when you go back to yours you'll have a better understanding of your chancellor or president and what he or she is going through. Uh, the other, the, when the students first arrived uh, this fall, my wife and I went around to all of the residence halls and welcomed the students and parents and gave them snacks and water and helped them bring their stuff up to the room, which is kind of a time-honored tradition among university presidents and chancellors. And we went into one room and there, were, there was our student and uh, her parents. And I walked in and I said, hi, I'm Holden Thorpe and I'm the chancellor of the university. And the student's mother said, that's great. Can you show us how to hook up the internet? <laughs> And it turned out I knew how to do that, so that was a, that was a relief. <laughs> um, thankfully, we still just use Ethernet cables to hook things up, so I was able to do that. Um, so what I thought I would do is talk to you a little bit about the kinds of people that I think are going to be successful in universities and, and, and to talk a little bit about, uh, about what we think of at Carolina when we think about how to identify leaders for our units. But it's important at this point to talk about the fact that all academics are leaders. Uh, I bet uh, those of you who are in faculty positions or uh, if you get offers to be in faculty positions, you're going to get a letter that says, we expect you to be a leader in your field. Uh, so we expect our uh, faculty to be leaders in their field, and we also expect them to run laboratories and, and teach graduate students and have research groups. And so how we deal with people is critically important. And I think it's only going to get more important 
as uh, we get past uh, a lot of the uh, difficulties that we've had getting information before uh, and move now into what are we going to do with that information. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we look for when we look for uh, people to be in the university and then talk about some of the characteristics that I see them having. Um, I didn't get, here we go. Okay, good. So when I um, look for people to uh, bring into the university or when people ask me um, what I view my job as being, I look at these four things that I've listed up here. And I'll start at the bottom and work my way to the top because the top is, because uh, these are in reverse order of priority. So the two things at the bottom are things that probably all of you, as you think about starting your academic career, are, realize are, are important to you. The first is to uh, articulate the problem that you are interested in studying um, or the field that you're going to be leading. Uh, for me, it's just explaining to people what the university is for and why we're here. And in a public university, uh, that's a particular challenge because sometimes I'm called on to explain what the University of North Carolina is all about to all 10 million of its residents. Uh, the legislature uh, is really looking to us to make the case for higher education here. Uh, but for those of you who will be starting your own research group one day, uh, telling people what you're doing and why it's important and why it's challenging will be uh, critically important. And then tied to that is another thing that I think you all know that uh, is so important to all of us, and that's getting the resources that we need to succeed. Uh, for researchers, that means getting uh, usually federal grants, but for those of us administration, that means getting uh, money from the states, and it means getting uh, private gifts. Uh, then the two things at the top are things that we don't always look for as well as we should when we identify people to come in the university. Um, getting people in and out of your organization is a skill that we don't really go over too much in graduate school, but yet the success of lots of folks, even early in their career, relies on that. Almost every PI has to tell a graduate student that they're not going to be in graduate school for as long as they thought they were. And uh, it's, to me, it's a problem that we don't give uh, young faculty more tools to do that uh, until uh, they uh, do, the, do this on the job. And so one of the things I think we could all commit ourselves to <clears throat> is trying to help young faculty uh, learn a little bit more about how to work with people before they get themselves in, in the kinds of uh, situations that they do. We know deans and department chairs and provosts and chancellors have to do these things, but um, the sooner we build them into our universities, the better our universities are going to be at getting the right people into academics and helping them succeed. And finally, uh, keeping your head in a crisis. When I talk to chemists, I tell them, well, this is what's going to happen when you have an accident in your laboratory. Uh, I imagine in your field, this is what's going to happen when somebody's doing something on, with data that they're not supposed to do uh, and how you uh, maintain a uh, sense of order as you deal with these things is important to you. I know for me the fact that uh, I got to be chair of the chemistry department where uh, you can imagine there are a number of different safety and uh, security uh, things that are running a department of 400 people. I learned a lot about uh, keeping my head in a crisis. Um, so these are the four things that, uh, that, that I think frame uh, the concept of leadership and hopefully I've given you uh, by going through these, I've saved you having to go to your business school bookstore or to Walden Books and read 300 books that uh, describe these same things. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've done that I think has helped certainly with uh, communicating what we're trying to do in, in the administration, um, both to external audiences and to internal audiences, is I have a, I have a blog, uh, and it's pretty interesting. Our, um, the, one of the first uh, blogs we did was about a hot local issue uh, that Jose Marie alluded to. Uh, there was uh, legislation passed before I became chancellor uh, 
uh, giving the university the authority to go into rural, North, rural Orange County, which is our county here, and uh, take land by eminent domain to build an airport. And you can imagine there are people who live in Orange County who weren't particularly thrilled about this idea. And we spent about three months trying to communicate and get a discussion going about how we might resolve uh, this situation. There were, there were constituencies who got the legislation passed who thought the airport was very important. And uh, for some reason, <laughs> I think I know the reason, but it, as it turned out, the university was going to be the vehicle by which this was done. Uh, and this was a situation I inherited. So we spent a lot of time describing this on our blog and letting people post uh, things to the blog. And the, uh, the first nasty comment we got, our uh, public relations officer came in my office and she said, we got this really nasty comment on your blog. So she said, what do you want me to do with it? I said, what do you want me to do? I said, what do you mean, what do I want you to do with it? She said, well, we're not going to post this on our website, are we? I said, yes, we are going to post it on our website. And we did do that. And um, we posted all the comments we got, if they were acceptable. And um, after three months, we came to a decision not to build the airport. And as Jose Marie uh, said, I got a Sunday named after me in, in recognition of that. <laughs> um, uh, so here are two things we did that I think have been useful. One. Uh, you can see at the top is publicizing uh, trips that we've made out to the schools of North Carolina, I think, so that legislators can see uh, how we uh, reach out to North Carolina. And then for internal audiences, um, we posted some stuff describing how we decide whether to cancel class uh, when it snows. Those of you who are from places that have actual snow um, <laughs> might know that if the uh, if snow is forecast here, that's what we call a three loafer. That means everybody in North Carolina goes by three loaves of bread. Uh, because apparently in the South, if it snows, um, everyone wants to eat bread. <coughs> Nobody knows the reason for this. Uh, but the, there's a problem in that almost everyone who works in uh, South Building, which is where our administrators work, either is from or has lived in places that have real snow. And the students who are mostly not from those places and haven't lived there don't necessarily agree with us when we say we think everybody can get to campus. So we have a little bit about that on our blog. All right. So now as we think about, um, you know, communicating and getting the right people, what are the characteristics that, uh, that folks inside our universities who are going to become the knowledge workers are going to have, and I think um, entrepreneurial thinking is a very important characteristic that we're going to see more of. And a lot of people think that when I talk about entrepreneurial thinking in the university that I'm talking about the university creating more businesses. Now, we may create more businesses, although as I'll say, I'm not sure how we're going to fund those businesses in the short term. Uh, but what I really mean is that entrepreneurial thinking uh, which I've outlined here, I think is likely to be more prevalent in universities than it has been. So entrepreneurs, for example, are more committed to realizing their idea than they are in realizing it a certain way. Uh, we had um, Bill Drayton, who is the founder of Ashoka, which is the leading social entrepreneurship funder uh, in, in America. and. Um, I asked him, I said, Bill, how do you know an entrepreneur? And he said, an entrepreneur is somebody who learns whatever they have to learn in order to realize their idea. Uh, so entrepreneurs are driven by ideas and not driven so much by how things are organized or how they get done. Entrepreneurs are driven to, to solve problems. Um, and I think we can all list what those are that we have before us right now in the middle of this uh, financial crisis and the middle health care crisis and all the other things that we have ahead of us. One analogy I like to use is the kind of people we're looking for, they come to you and want a cake, and if you give them a cake mix, they go away happy and bake, bake their cake. Um, instead of some people who come to you and ask for a cake and want you to bake it for them, put the icing on it, put it in a box, put a bow around it, and drive it, off, drive it over to their house and drop it off. 
Uh, so the people who come to me and say they want to start a new program and this or that, or they have a new idea for this, when I say, I think that's a really good idea, I think you ought to go out and get the money for it and do it, um, they have to realize that that's what yes looks like. And there are people around here who, uh, who realize that, and then there are a lot of folks in universities who don't, don't grasp that yet. Another, again, to save you time at uh, Walden Books buying a business book, I'll tell you a little bit about a book by a guy named Roger Martin, who's at uh, the UVA Business School, who wrote a book called The Responsibility Virus. And the idea behind the responsibility virus is that um, that's an infection that people get when they protect their turf and worry about um, whether they are uh, losing face or not compared to actually achieving their idea. Uh, and universities are easily infected with the response by the responsibility virus because we're organized into schools and departments. And some folks put the, the future of their school and department ahead of the future of the university. And that's kind of what this responsibility virus uh, rubric is all about. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I recommend Roger Martin's book to you. Um, he goes through a lot of the kind of psychology that creates that mindset. Okay, a good example of what we're doing at Carolina to um, provide this kind of entrepreneurial thinking is something that we're calling the uh, North Carolina uh, Tracks Institute, which is the Translational and Clinical Sciences Institute. Like most universities that have major medical uh, schools we have competed with and we're thankfully competed for and we're thankfully successful getting a clinical and translational science award from the National Institutes of Health which pushes us to reorganize the way we do translational research along many of the lines that I've just discussed and uh, from the earliest days of uh, envisioning this institute that we created in conjunction with getting this award to promote uh, translational uh, health research, uh, we had uh, imagined from the very beginning that the School of Information and Library Science would be a part of that. And uh, Jose Marie and her colleagues are all investigators in the CTSA award. And so I think the, the mere fact that you would, that, that an institution would include uh, the Information and Library Science School in, a, in an NIH grant uh, that was awarded to the School of Medicine is the kind of entrepreneurial thinking and the, uh, the kind of uh, silo breaking that uh, we think is so important. Okay, so that kind of gets to this whole notion of creating an institutional mindset in your organization that promotes the common good of the institution over the individual units of the institution. And that, again, is something that Martin goes through his, in his um, book that I uh, commend to you. And it's also aided uh, by the uh, progress that we are making and need to make much faster at diversifying the decision-making teams that we have inside our university. There was an outstanding piece in yesterday's New York Times by Nick Kristoff who was uh, making the case that the financial crisis might not have happened if there had been more women working in the boardrooms on Wall Street. Um, those of us who work in, in teams that are diversifying, and as, as Jose Marie said, I've worked in the business world, which isn't nearly as well diversified as universities. And I have to agree with Nick Kristoff that uh, the more diverse we make our decision-making teams, the more different points of view we have, the different kinds of patterns that we have of, of um, protecting ourselves and therefore um, the, the better decisions that we're going to make. Uh, and the last point I learned from uh, the CEO of a bank that is doing okay, one that's still standing, and I went to see him on a development call and uh, we were talking about how he identifies people to move up in his organization. And you know, I said, how do you, how do you to decide who's going to be a executive in the corporate, uh, the central corporate operations of your bank? And he said, 
Well, we look at people in the individual units and we see who's good at working between the silos. And if they're good at working between the silos, then that means that they're a good candidate to move up in the bank. And I think that organizations sometimes have an have a temptation to promote people who are good at protecting their silo uh, because they're likely to make their unit very successful. But I, I would recommend that uh, maybe we consider that we'd be better off if we uh, identify people who can work between the silos. All right, so that's kind of a framework for how we might address the situation that we're in right now. Um, it's no secret that we're in a global financial crisis, and I think there are a couple things that are different about the, this one. I mean, lots of people are talking about how this one's different. I'll give you two that um, I think are, are unusual. The first is that um, the students are aware of the fact that we're in a recession. Uh, even the ones who are just getting out of high school. Uh, this is this has hit home with me because a lot of people have been talking about how this recession compares to the one that we had in 1982. Now 1982 is the year that I came to college and I had absolutely no idea we were in a recession. But I asked the high school seniors that are coming to our university whether they know if we're in a recession or not and almost all of them are quite aware of that. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a new feature I think for us and the other thing that's unusual is that everybody inside the university is well aware of this. Uh, and so the so far uh, Carolina and probably most of your universities have been able to start planning for how we're going to deal with this financial crisis without a lot of um, jockeying from people who think that somehow their unit is going to be immune from the cutbacks that we're likely to have uh, here. I think the other thing that's helped us is that we weren't the first state to be affected by this. California and Michigan are, are a couple years ahead of us in dealing with this. So state budgets are in trouble. You probably saw over the weekend that the Senate and the House are debating how much they're going to help the state budgets. Of course, we like the House version better. Um, the House is uh, more eager to help state budgets that are in trouble. Um, then I think a third one, which is really important for all of us who are interested in getting um, information and, and knowledge uh, translated to the economy, the venture capitalists are uh, severely pulling back on the investments that they're going to make. So the ideas that we have that might turn into venture-backed businesses, I think we have to be pretty circumspect about whether it's possible that we're going to get them f funded by venture capital any time in the next few years. Almost every venture capitalist is holding back money to take care of the investments that they've already made and um, they're they're being very cautious about uh, the valuations, both of the follow-on rounds and the new investments that they make. And uh, we also went through this only seven years ago, so there are a lot of venture capitalists who remember what happened last time. So when people come to me and tell me, because I have experience of this, they ask me about whether they can fund a venture-backed business, and my advice to them is that they should charge ahead, but they should have a way to finance what they're going to do that wouldn't require them to get a venture capital investment. And so I think that that means that research funding for, uh, from the on the private side is very uncertain, but yet at the same time it appears almost certain that federal funding for research is going to increase. And um, so we have different segments of the university, some of whom are working in areas that are being starved for resources, and some who are working in areas of the university that are going to get a lot more resources. And this, provide, this produces a, a really fascinating leadership and management challenge for all of us. Uh, that is, you know, I have folks working for me, some of whom are going to get a new grant funded or going to get their budget or their grant increased while the person who is doing HR and finance for the researchers working on that grant is worried about losing her job. And that's a really uh, complicated challenge that we're all going to face. 
Okay, but <clears throat> there are silver linings um, in these things for universities in particular, and I always tell uh, folks when I'm speaking to business leaders that the good thing about being a university president or chancellor instead of a, a business leader is that we produce good news even in the absolute worst of times. Um, and the first thing is something that all of your universities are seeing, I'm sure, and that is an increase in the number of applications uh, to your graduate programs in particular and for, for us to our undergraduate programs as well. So there's never been a better time to uh, get people into the university than we have right now. And that includes, you know, in the, to the extent that we're able to hire people, that's there as well. Um, the advances in science continue. We, we're not going to stop making breakthroughs uh, in, in information science or health sciences, the hard sciences, just because uh, there's a recession going on. And I think as we all have seen, the administration is going to increase their investments in, in science uh, across the board. That, that, looks, that seems to be in both uh, the House and Senate packages, and so we're likely to see those. And then I think the fourth thing is that the, this uh, generation of young people that are coming to our universities are more committed to, uh, to creativity and to public service than any generation that we've seen in the past. I know it's more so true of my generation because my generation is the one that created the financial crisis that we have through our lack of commitment to uh, public service. So I'm happy to see this generation uh, coming through with the greater good in mind, and I'm extremely optimistic about what our students are going to do in the world when they get out of here. Um, but just to talk a little bit about the, uh, this, uh, this generation, which I think is uh, totally, literally plugged into what you were doing, as this anecdote that I uh, related earlier uh, lays out. One of our people from Student Affairs came and gave a talk to the Faculty Council about the millennial generation. And he said that this generation is always online, they send emails at 3 o'clock in the morning, and everything they do is public on the internet. And I thought, wow, these people are going to make great chancellors. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think everything that we can do to help these folks realize their creativity, uh, which is, I know, uh, important to all of you, uh, I think, again, just raises my optimism about what they can accomplish. And if you look at things like the Millennium Development Goals, which I'd say were, were, were realized uh, by this generation, and the outcome of the latest election, um, I think was realized by this generation's commitment to service and the technological tools that they have access to. Okay, so what can universities do to take advantage of all this? Well, certainly we need to break down the silos and uh, do more in terms of interdisciplinary scholarship. And then we need to take this, um, we need to take and recognize what the generation that's coming through can achieve. And I think all we need to do to get them to achieve the things that, that we need them to work on or to get them pointed to the right problems. So I said they, they, this, they wanted to get Obama elected. They did it. They wanted to get the Millennium Development Goals um, on people's radar, and they've done a lot in global health. But for example, we have problems in the United States that we haven't done as good a job of directing our young people towards as we can. So we have global health and global poverty and health care problems in the United States. Uh, I think the more we can do to get those on the radar of the uh, students and graduate students in our universities, the, the greater the chance that they'll succeed. I think they have the tools and the ability and the idealism that we need to get them to address these things. So then finally, um, I'd just like to talk to a little bit about um, the people that are going to be able to do all these things. And uh, those of you who watch the New York Times nonfiction list know that there are, there's a book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, which is the top selling nonfiction book in the country and probably will be for a while given his, his ability to succeed at writing nonfiction books, uh, in, in which he uh, talks about the, uh, the concept of talent as being a myth. 
Uh, instead, he says that it's really about intangible opportunities and about um, desire and effort. And then <clears throat> for those of you who, uh, who think that this is just being driven by Malcolm Gladwell's ideological agenda, there's also a book by a writer of Fortune magazine, which isn't selling as well, but is along the same lines, called Talent is Overrated. And um, I think this is consistent with what we see with the students that come into our university. Uh, and it's a, maybe a good time for me to point out something that always reminds me of this. My wife has a beautiful singing voice. And lots of times when we're at a basketball game or a funeral, and people are sitting in front of us and they hear her singing, they turn around and say, you have such a beautiful gift. And this drives her crazy because she spent her life going to singing lessons. <laughs> so she doesn't think about her singing voice as a gift. She thinks of it as something that she's worked her tail off to have her whole life. Um, and I think that's, a, that's a, a, a good reminder of what we're doing in, the, in education. Now some examples that um, that Gladwell and Colvin uh, lay out for us, I think, are all pretty instructive. And if you've read uh, Malcolm's book, uh, I apologize for going through a couple of these. Uh, the, lots of people think the Beatles just uh, did drugs and chased women um, and played rock and roll. But in fact, the Beatles, when they went to Hamburg, they played 12 hours a day. And when they wrote their first hit, they had written 66 other songs that didn't succeed. Uh, Canadian hockey players, if they're all-stars, they're more likely to be born in the months of January, February, and March. Eighty percent of Canadian all-stars are born in those three months. And the reason is because the age cutoff for the different leagues in Canadian youth hockey is January 1st. So if you're born in January, then you're a little bit bigger and more likely to make the all-star team and more likely to have more practice than somebody who's born in December. Tiger Woods started playing golf when he was four years old. He's been obsessed with it his whole life. So when he won his first green jacket, he'd been playing golf for 14 years. Uh, and Bill Gates, as I think everybody here probably knows, grew up around the corner from a mainframe that he could use between 2 and 6 in the morning. And he snuck out of his house to use his mainframe when he was a child. So you, know, you could argue that none of these folks uh, you know, had a gift. They were all obsessed with what they were doing, and they had the intangible opportunities that it took for them to succeed. Um, and I think the folks that, uh, that are going to continue to succeed are folks that are going to embrace that. Um, Dan Pink talks about high concept, high touch, that is design is very important and the ability to work with people is very important. Now I think we're all seeing that this sort of uh, ethic tends to aggregate in geographical areas. And we've tried very hard to make the Research Triangle Park area one of the areas where uh, these highly valuable uh, people tend to aggregate. And I think, we're, uh, I think we're seeing that. You know, again, the people that we're trying to attract are going to be attracted to the big problems. And uh, the faster we can make progress on gender equity and diversity, uh, the better decisions we're going to make. So here's just some observations. Um, and this, one, this one's always tough, and it's, um, that is that if you look at it, people who are su successful, they're obsessed with what they're doing. And that also means that work-life balance is something we still haven't solved. Definitely Bill Gates and Tiger Woods and the Beatles didn't have work-life balance. So I, uh, I regret that, and I'm not sure I have good advice about how we're going to get somewhere on that. Um, and then I think another thing that it's important to stress to our students is that working with people is just as valuable towards being successful as the science itself. And this is something that I think we can all go a long way at introducing into the way we teach, particularly our graduate students. So our graduate students come out thinking that science is, is important and nothing else is important, but then they have to run a lab and they um, they don't have the tools they need to do that. And then, of course, I think entrepreneurial thinking, as I've said, will be valuable. So um, just as a challenge that I put forward at the end here, I think most people, um, you know, I'm not saying anything that's uh, particularly controversial here, except maybe to 
to end by asking if all of these things that I've, I've said are things that uh, we agree are important, you know, that leadership and entrepreneurial thinking and an institutional mindset are important, is that really how we select people for careers in universities? Um, and I would say it isn't. Um, we have a tendency to put uh, a lot of emphasis when we're hiring faculty or deans or chancellors or provosts on their vision. But I wonder if the people who have vision that we perceive are really just the people who are good at explaining uh, the, a vision that we all have more than that they have one of their own. Uh, we certainly put a lot of emphasis on their ability to get the resources that they need. So we have a tendency to pick deans and chancellors by their ability to raise private money. Uh, we have a tendency to pick faculty members by the prospects we think they have for getting grants. Uh, and those, those, those things are important. And then we put, a lot of, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the ability of, of folks to explain what they want to do. We have them come give seminars, and we go to their seminar, and if their seminar is really good and we understand what they're talking about, then we're likely to hire them for a faculty position. Um, and all the other things that I guess I'm arguing might determine success more are things that we really don't test except in real time. And um, I guess I would challenge you as part of what, uh, what you do in your work in information to help us figure out how we could do a better job at bringing people into the university who have uh, the full range of commitments uh, to the, the entire work of the university. And, you know, I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts on how we might do that. So those are some of the things that I wanted to, to tell you this morning, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.